Now, this class is called Setbacks in Construction. I assume you are here because you are either facing setbacks in construction, have in the past, or are wise enough to know that they may very well come. And uh, as, uh, my name is Fernando Alejandro. I am from the Pioneer Valley Church of Christ in Mass Western Massachusetts. Uh, I lead the singles ministry there. Uh, and I am going to be presenting with Angela Perry. She is on staff uh, with the Southern Region of the Boston Church of Christ Singles Ministry. And uh, she's going to be speaking to, to the women in the room. Uh, but men, that is also a time for you to listen as well and hear uh, the messages that, that you're, the women you're leading with are going to be hearing today. And of course, please listen to me. <laughs> Let's turn over to Nehemiah chapter 1. So Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it reads, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, Larry had talked about earlier how Nehemiah had a heart to be moved. And for us, we take a look at, at the situation that we're reading here. And Nehemiah, he's faced, or he's hearing about a situation in Jerusalem where the people are in disgrace. The people are living in a destroyed city. And for Nehemiah, he understood for the Jewish people that living in the ruins of the city, seeing the wall crumble down around them, the gates on fire, he understood that the people saw that as a symbol of their rebellion against God. So every time they walk past those destroyed walls and those burnt down gates, they see a symbol of their steadfast rebellion against God and a symbol of God exiling them and destroying them because of their stubbornness of sin. How discouraging would it be if you had to constantly face the reminders of your people's rebellion or your own personal rebellion? For Nehemiah, he saw the condition of the city as the condition of the people. The people needed to be restored. And, and the crazy thing about it is Ezra had come. He had built the temple. The temple worship was going on. And they understood and saw the physical presence of God in the city. But as long as that wall wasn't built, they understood that the people still were not restored. And some of us, we have ministries that are in a similar situation where we see that God's presence is there, but the walls of our ministries are destroyed. Where we take a look around and we say, wow, there's only a few committed members. People don't want to be a part of this group. People aren't showing up. Maybe you had some influential leaders or, or, or a staff who either left or moved away or in some cases fell away. And you're looking around and saying, what, what is going on with my city? What is going on with my ministry? Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we look around and we say, you know what? I contributed to this. I stood idly by while the city fell into disrepair. And we feel that guilt. And Nehemiah, it was stated before that he had nothing to do with it. it wasn't, he, he wasn't the one who destroyed the city. But when he saw the condition, he knew he needed to be moved to action. And for us, it's such an important point. We need to have vision. This is, the separ this is what separated Nehemiah from everyone else who walked past that wall day after day but did nothing about it. He had vision. Read on in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love and those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Nehemiah turned immediately to prayer. And within that prayer, God started fostering a vision of restoration for Israel. <laughs> A true godly vision will have its inspiration in God's spirit. He will move your heart. And we have to be attentive to those things. 
as I mentioned, so many people saw the wall, saw the condition, and knew where it stood. But Nehemiah was the first one who said, I'm going to do something about it. We have to be people who want to do something about it. And when you think about having vision, vision is essential. Anyone who calls themselves leader or if someone else calls you a leader, you need to have vision for your people. Vision gives hope. It communicates something that, it, it communicates to people that where things are now is not where they are going to be. And that's who we need to become. And Nehemiah, he took off after it as we know. He went to the city. It says in Nehemiah chapter 2, in verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble where in Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. See, vision inspired the people. No one living in that city was like, Yeah, I love living in a city with broken walls. No one there was like, I love the condition of Jerusalem right now. It's so inspiring to me. No one believed that. And when Nehemiah spoke to that, they were already willing to go get behind his vision. True vision, a true godly vision will inspire. I'm going to have Angela come up and share about vision. Amen. Well, I'm Angela Perry, as introduced, and it's definitely uh, a great honor to be able to speak with you this afternoon. And as Fernando said, I will be specifically addressing the women in this lesson. So Nehemiah had a plan forming in his mind uh, while he was praying. And in chapter two, he begins dreaming and creating a vision. And you know, as a leader, our mind is our first influence. It's the influence of our decisions, our dreams, our visions, our action plans. Whatever our mind is consumed with will be the power that influences how you act. And that can go either way, right? Positive or negative. Because where the mind goes, the woman follows, right? That's how we are. You know, Nehemiah's mind was consumed with great anguish and agony that Jerusalem's wall lay in complete ruins. But consequently, that's what fueled and spurred on his thinking to implement a vision and a plan for a widespread spiritual and physical revival. But it could have gone the other way, right? Because this was a super depressing state of affairs for Jerusalem, right? And so his grieved mindset could have taken him downward, but he let this disturbing and distressing situation instead influence and lead him to a new dream and a mammoth vision. Are your dreams alive for your ministry? Do you have a thriving vision for your women? Are your dreams dead or stagnant? Do they even exist or have you given up? You know, sometimes the first opposition in building our ministries can be us. You know, and as a leader, certainly no one plans to land in this dreamless state, right? And certainly nobody enjoys that, but it can happen to the best of us. We can be our own setback especially if we have led for a while and things don't seem to be moving or things are declining, right? Your group is getting smaller. Or if things are just sort of stagnantly coasting and you're just sort of keeping the group in like survival mode, you know? Or if you have a really small ministry and you can't imagine or perceive what a few can do. Or if you have an unmotivated group or maybe a brand new group or a lot of naysayers. You know, if you've ever led in the kingdom on any one of these, you know, levels, then you're gonna be hit by a few of these. I know I have, I've been there. But as leaders, we have to fight not to fall into leadership fatigue. <laughs> Generally, folks will vibe off of you. So if you're not looking very inspiring, then you know what, it's gonna be a hard sell to get things rocking. You've got to instill and infuse the energy. You know, you've got to be the change you want to see. There is a quote that says, it will cost you nothing to dream and everything not to. The Bible says it this way in Proverbs 29, 18, in the King James Version, because sometimes you gotta go old school, you know? <laughs> but Proverbs 29, 18 in the KGV Version says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Do you have a vision for your folks? Because if you don't, then they could be perishing. If you aren't working towards something new and faith building, or if you haven't dreamt in a while, then sometimes this is the reason why you could be slowly perishing. And it doesn't always happen so quickly because Satan doesn't want you to be too aware so that you won't be too concerned. 
you know? But the Bible does warn that it is inevitable. So we've got to awaken and stimulate our spirit. Nehemiah dared to dream for his people. He was a visionary who faithfully made things happen. You know, in verse 12 of chapter two, we read it this morning, it says that Nehemiah first held the inspiration that he received from God in his heart and in his mind while he evaluated. The passage says, quoted, I have not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Next, Nehemiah spoke the vision. In verse 17, he said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then he and the people began the work. Verse 18, they replied, let us start building. You know, this scenario clearly supports the concept that how we think is how we speak is how we act. We think, we speak, we act. And you know, God is even this way. In Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light. And then there was light. Creation was first a thought. God had a first think, hmm, there should be some light, right? And then he spoke it. He said, let there be light. And then the action took place. It happened. So we are made and created in his likeness, are we not? So this is why we too are built this way. Now there are six action steps that we can glean from Nehemiah in building and constructing a vision. And I know that there are a lot of women in this room who lead their own groups or who have a significant role um, in leading groups and their women in their ministry. So I'd like to point out six steps. Number one, humbly pray for it. Pray for your vision. The first thing Nehemiah did before beginning the work was to focus his attention on prayer. He didn't wait. He didn't use prayer as a last resort. Prayer is where he began. He sat down and wept, fasted and prayed day and night before beginning the work. And you know, he began, um, it says in in the actual um, beginning of Nehemiah chapter one, it says that he began weeping and praying in in the month of Kislev, which is around the November, December time of our calendar month until the month of Nisan, which is around March or April. So that concludes that he prayed for four months, four months before he even opened his mouth. Women, that's convicting unquestionably. (laughs) He did not speak for four months. He just prayed before he even said anything. You know, sometimes we underrate and don't submit to the true power and effectiveness that prayer can have in changing and reviving our groups and ministries. So let's imitate Nehemiah and make prayer principle and put some real time in on it. Number two, measure it. Nehemiah went out at night to view and survey the area of the broken down walls and the burned gates to determine the dimensions and the extent of the work plan that he was going to devise. You know, he took note of exactly what needed to be done and he had an accurate assessment. So think through your plan and your goals while you evaluate and survey your individual group. Maybe your group needs a few improvements. Maybe your group lay in ruins. You know, whatever you may be, take inventory of an honest assessment of where your group is at, both the strengths and the weaknesses, and plan accordingly. Number three, compose it. Draw up your strategy to show that you are dedicated and focused. Write it down. You know, Angela Williams from LA, she is my hero in this, the woman who spoke to us uh, for the ladies. She writes down every single thing she thinks and she does, and that comes to fruition. I mean, she has a book. She's actually gonna publish it of everything she's done since she's been in leadership. It is inspiring. But we need to lay out our action plan with all the spelled out points and steps that it will take to reach your goal. And you want it because then it's clear to you and it also can be referred back to. Number four, believe it. Put your faith and your assurance 100% behind it, no doubt. You need to have an everything is possible attitude. It needs to be backed by your faith. You know, you need to expect with, opposite, with optimism and be wholehearted and certain about it. Number five, communicate it. Communicate a collective vision. First to your co-leader, if you have one, and then if approved to your group. You wanna reveal and transfer the plan with faith and excitement and enthusiastically express the goals you wish to reach through God's inspiration. Nehemiah said, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem. You know, expectant and confident delivery to your group makes all the difference. And number six, execute it. Put it into practice and implement the action plan. Construct your team 
and give each woman their delegated part of the wall. I had to learn that. You know, as leaders, women, sometimes we take it all, oh, I'll just do it. You ask someone, no, I don't, I'll forget it, I'll do it myself. We need to give women their part so that they can be involved. That's sometimes on us, right? We can take on a lot. You know, the people in Jerusalem were in great need, and they were a people without much. But they were moved by Nehemiah's vision and faith to rebuild their community, to put their hands to the work, and to serve God regardless of how destitute they were. Because of his inspirational plan and leadership, they rose to the challenge and heeded the call. Let's give our women something to build toward. Awesome. Guys, when we endeavor to do something great for God, Satan's always going to want to oppose it. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. We can, we can just expect it. It's bound to happen. In Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, it reads, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Yeah. Guys, I want to talk about some opposition we can face in building ministry within, within singles. And the first one I want to speak to is structural opposition. And uh, I, I want to talk a little bit candidly. Can, can we talk like a family here? Is that all right? Amen. And uh, I, I assume this is a safe place, so... Uh, I'm just going to throw this out there, but you know, for me, as I've, I, as I've witnessed through the years of being a disciple and being a single, it can seem like the singles ministries have gotten the short end of the stick. <laughs> and what I mean by that is when, when there's resources that are going to be used to build up the church, singles often get overlooked. And I, I was a product of this, so I don't, I don't knock it, but we have a, a campus uh, a very ca uh, high campus focus within our churches. And uh, as I said, I was a product of it, but sometimes it can feel a little overdone. You know, we, they hire some campus ministers and you're like, great, that's cool, they got, they got that. And they're like, oh, we're gonna hire some interns. And we're like, awesome, are they coming to the singles? No, they're all for the campus. They're like, there's like 10 people in campus, why do you need six staff members there? And we can feel that. We can feel that. We're like struggling to get ourselves a line item on the budget so we could have a party. And, and every resource gets allocated elsewhere. And then we build up Bible talk leaders. We have singles who, who we finally get to a place of leadership. And then the church comes tapping on, on our shoulder. Hey, we need to, people to go into the teens. We need people to go into campus. Can you, can you give up your best people? And we're like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> and we can feel that we can oftentimes feel like our vision for singles is overlooked. And you know, when I think of that sort of environment, I also have to think, what is God trying to communicate to us in that? Because the truth of the matter is, if God wanted us to have those resources, wanted us to have staff, we would have them, would we not? And so if God can provide it and he's not, what is he saying to us? My opinion, from what I've observed, he's saying you guys need to step up. You need to stop looking outside of your groups for the answers and become the Nehemiahs of your ministries. We have to stop making excuses for why things are the way they are. We are adults, are we not? Guys, the teen ministry, they can't lead themselves. Campus ministry, they're adults, but they can't lead themselves. Singles can lead ourselves. And not only that, we can lead the churches. And this is where we need to have vision for our ministries, vision for ourselves. We have to stop looking to, to the outside for the help. We have to stop look, waiting for Nehemiah to show up into our ministries. God works through Nehemiah's faith, and he works through our faith as well. Some other opposition we face is inward opposition. You know, there's a lot of people in our singles ministries who have a very limited view of what this time of their life can be. And it's sad. It's sad to see it. People treat singles ministry like it's a waiting period for them to get married. 
Like, as soon as I get married, that's when I'll go and do awesome things. But while I'm here, I'm just battening down the hatches and waiting myself out. <laughs> we have a lot of singles who do that. They're, they're camped out in marriage group. Oh, I like being in the marriage group because they meet once a month. <laughs> that's, that's your vision for yourself. That's sad. But, you know, th that has to, a lot to do with lack of vision. Right. It has to do with a lack of vision for singles. And for me... When I look at that, I look at what the Bible says. Paul talks about this time of our life as being a time where we have undivided devotion to God. When we have a spouse, we have to divide our devotion. But right now, this is the time you can be most undivided in your devotion to God. And we need to take advantage of this privilege that we've been given. You know, and I get it. I want to be married. I want to date. I want to move on in that portion of my life. But as long as God has me here, I'm going to live my fiercest for God. And we all need to have that same vision for ourselves. <laughs> Singles ministry isn't a dating ministry. Singles ministry isn't just about matchmaking. It's about living our most and to the fullest for our God. The inward opposition we can face, we can also face spiritual opposition. There can come a time in doing God's work where our circumstances dictate and everything in our experience seems to confirm that God has abandoned our work. You look at Nehemiah, he's been building it up and all of a sudden they're saying, guys, the laborers can't go on. Could you imagine that? Getting told this news that the people working can't work anymore. That would seem like a huge stopping point, would it not? And then they come along and they say, the enemies are saying they're going to kill us. And then the Jews come and ten times over say, hey, wherever we turn, they're going to attack us. And it can be easy to look at the circumstances and say, God's not here anymore. I don't think he wants this done. And we can abandon our work. I want to share a little bit of my own experience. You know, we, we, I've, I've faced uh, some interesting um, opposition myself. Back in uh, my early 20s, I was ministering over the campus in my local church. And this is a time where our, our church was going through a rough period. We had lost leaders, um, and it was pretty much a, Fernando, get in there and do your best. We don't have your back. And it was, it was kind of like, a, you know, you, you can call us, but we're not, we're, we, we can't meet with you. Um, you know, people were, it, it was the circumstances. And there, uh, there were two men in, in the ministry, two seniors. And um, I went to a campus conference, and we, I heard this message. It was really inspiring. It was like, guys, we had five people on our campus. Now we have 50, and it's all by faith and vision that God moved through our actions. And now we have this great campus ministry. So, of course, I get fired up, and I'm like, yes, God is going to build us a campus ministry. So I get really inspired, and I start having my own vision. I start having my own prayers. And I, I communicate my vision and prayers to the two guys, and they get fired up. They're like, yeah, we're going to build a camp. This is our senior year. We're going to walk out of here with a bang. One of the guys, he quit his job. He was like, you know what? My senior year, I'm going to be focused on building the kingdom. And so I started, I started praying, and I'm like, you know, God, you could give us 19 baptisms this year. I start going after it, too. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go out there and share my faith. I'm going to be the boldest I've ever been sharing my faith. And I got out there. And I started doing that, going out there by myself with others, sharing my faith, trying to build up the campus. I'm praying specifics. I'm like, God, I want to study with like a baseball player because that's my sport. And, I, you know, doing all of that. And I go out there, I share with somebody, and he's like, you know what, I'm an agnostic, but my roommate, he's looking for something just like this. And he calls his roommate right on the phone, and he hands me the phone, and I talk to the guy, and the guy's fired up. And I'm like, yes, this is the beginning of what God's going to do in our ministry. And I show up, and, and the guy doesn't. And I'm like, no problem. you got to persist, right? So I keep going after. I'm sharing my faith. I run into this couple, and, and I, I talk to them about church. And they're like, you know, it's so funny. We were just talking about going back to church. And I was like, God's been planting seeds in their heart. Here's the harvest. Here it comes. And we show it up, and, and they don't. And uh, I, I kept going out there. I met a baseball player, and he, he talked about, oh, maybe I'll come. He didn't. And I, you know, I keep sharing my faith. I'm going out there, and week after week, we're spreading the message, trying to get it out there, and no one's really being receptive. So I'm like, no problem, we'll switch up the plan. I reached out to some of the other campus ministers in the area, and I was like, hey, can you come out here and help us share our faith and do a Bible talk? They're like, yes, we're behind you 100%, until they canceled. And then... <laughs> 
And then, and then we rescheduled. We rescheduled, and, and they canceled on the day of. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm feeling discouraged here. So I'm like, no problem. I, I turned to a, a married brother, and he had done these controversial topic-type uh, conversations on our campus before. I'm like, hey, could you do one of those for us? And we started promoting it. We got people's emails. We sent out this mass email. This is happening. And then the brother canceled. And, and we rescheduled it to have it canceled again. And you know, by the end of that, everywhere I turned, I was like, you know, God's not doing this. I got so discouraged. I was so disheartened. And with that, what happened is I abandoned the work. I said, you know what, God's just not doing this here. He's not trying to make this happen. And maybe it'll be someone else. For me, I blame myself. I blame my own sin. I said, God can't possibly use me, as if the Bible wasn't filled with examples of him using people who are sinners, right? Yeah. And I got to that point of burnout, discouragement. And I share that because I think that there's people out there who've had similar experiences. I think there are people out here who have put faith behind a vision, have put the actions behind it, and didn't see the results they were expecting. And now they feel disheartened. They don't want to continue going. And I hear you. I've been there. I can relate to it. And the thing I learned is that we can't live there. In our de defeats, do we remember and have faith in God's promises? We say that God's abandoned us. We can feel that at times, do we not? But what do the scriptures say? Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. And you know, when I think about someone who had the right to feel abandoned, I think of Joseph. You guys know the story of Joseph? Yes. Man, he was like the favored son. Life's going pretty good for him. And he gets sold into slavery. And he's like, man, well, it can't get much worse than this, right? He gets put in prison. And now he's like, oh, man, I had a few rights as a slave. I have none as a prisoner. This is terrible. And he's remained there for many years. And you have to imagine that Joseph was praying, God, get me out of here. Yes. I want to be out of here. I don't like being in prison. But day after day, if he's saying these prayers, it took time for God to, to get him out of there. Could you imagine if he had abandoned God in that moment? If he had said, God, you know what? You're not doing it for me. You're not backing me up. I was trying to, I was trying to be a righteous person. I, I, one wrong after another keeps getting committed against me. You've clearly abandoned me. I'm abandoning you. Could you imagine if he had done that? He would have never lived to see himself become second in command over all of Egypt. God was setting up a blessing all that time. And if Joseph had abandoned God at that moment, he would have missed all of it. There's too many people who abandon God at the wrong time. When we get into our lowest points, that's when we have to have the faith that God is still working that God hasn't abandoned us. Satan wants us to believe that God's abandoned us, but he has not. Guys, sometimes it's not about the results, it's about the journey. You think of someone like Moses. He was in, in the position in the royal household, and he went out to try to save Israel his own way. He killed a guy. He thought that that was like the best approach. Turned out it wasn't, and he got exiled. He runs out into the desert, and there, he, uh, he becomes a shepherd. A job he would have never had had he been in the royal household the whole time. He shepherds the sheep in the desert. And then after some time, God comes back to him and he says, you know what, now that you've had that experience, shepherding sheep in the desert, you can shepherd my people Israel through their desert. God was preparing him through all that he was going through. The experience that he had in all those years, God was moving him. And when he was ready, he came for him. Guys, the results may or may not be there for our ministry. But the results in our hearts are always going to be there. God's always working to build us up. God's always working to build his kingdom. We are being molded day by day. And we can't lose sight of that. Guys, turn over to Nehemiah 4. When Nehemiah faced the opposition, when things looked the bleakest, when the laborers didn't want to work, 
when the enemy wanted to attack, this is what Nehemiah did in beginning in verse 13. It says, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Nehemiah saw the opposition, but he held on to the belief of what God was going to do. He trusted in God's character and he reminded the people of it. He said, guys, God is great and awesome. That hasn't changed just because the circumstances have changed. When we look at our own ministries and we reach the opposition points, when we reach the slowdown points, when we reach those, those low moments, we have to remember who God is because that doesn't change even if our emotions do. And if we trust God, if we trust God, then we're able to persevere. Perseverance is an action that starts with a belief. And we're able to persist and persevere when we really believe that God is who he says he is. You know, it's good to know that uh, there are many people in the Bible who faced opposition long before we have, right? And uh, like Nehemiah, who was an expert builder, yet he uh, experienced setbacks. And, um, you know, Nehemiah uh, and his team, they began uh, a great work, right? The remnant in Jerusalem was inspired to get back to work. And then God had opened the floodgates for folks to come back. Captives return like men who dream until chapters three and four, where great opposition started. And that was both internally and externally. And Nehemiah, like we keep reading over it, there was so much in front of him. He had to deal with the lazy nobles who wouldn't put their shoulders to the work. Then he was getting it from the followers of God who was saying, we're tired, the work is too much, your vision isn't realistic. You know, and then he had Sam Ballard, Tobiah, and their boys, first mocking them and then saying, we're gonna be all over you and we're gonna kill you. Then he had the faceless Jews saying, they're gonna attack us 10 times over. You know, that is opposition in full force. Sometimes we think we face a lot. That is a whole lot going on there. But you know, as, no matter w what happens um, in, in, in your leadership, you've always got to remember that opposition is just going to be there. It just always will be. As fantastic as your plan may be and sound, opposition is inevitable. You know, some may be lazy. Some may refuse and rebel against your wonderful plan. Some may be uninspired. Some may fight the vision. Some may stir up trouble. Some may cause intense adversarial threats and feelings. Either way, they come. You know, it's a part of the process. It comes with the territory of what we do. But don't freak out. Stay grounded. You know, verse 9 of chapter 4, let's look at what Nehemiah did. It says, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. When opposition comes, we need to do exactly what Nehemiah did. We need to pray and meet the threat and keep the plan moving. You know, Nehemiah, he didn't forestall or cower or stop, you know, because the mission and the purpose is far greater than any opposition that will stand in the way of God. And verse uh, 14 of chapter 4, it says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. You know, God will build his church, and he will build with or without folks on board. You know, God is just using us to get things accomplished in his house as he leads it and as he leads us. So we don't have to take things personally. We really don't. For Nehemiah, he understood this. And so giving up wasn't an option. He knew God was in perfect control. You know, he was like, go big or go home. You know, he went big and God sent his enemies home. So you know what? Face the opposition with confidence. In chapter 2, uh, verse 20, and this is in the New King James Version. I like hanging out in the King, new or old. That's, that's where I've been because sometimes you just need a change, you know, and read things differently. And I love the way it says it in, in this version. It says, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. 
You know, I'd like to share a time with you um, somewhere, some years back when the ministry that I was a part of in Boston faced a lot of opposition and uh, our ministry fundamentally lay in ruins as we knew it. We had fired our evangelist and there was no one leading in our church for quite a bit of time. And it was a very confusing, very disheartening, very discouraging time. And honestly, apathy had just started to settle in across the church. There was no real vision in sight. And because of that, the single men were completely uninspired. It was like the light had gone out from their eyes. And you know, in my heart, I knew something had to be done. So I approached another pretty proactive single sister and grabbed lunch with her to see how we could brainstorm, how to initiate, um, spurring on the brothers to get something going in our ministry. You know, we prayed and we felt led to mobilize a band of sisters who hosted a pretty fantastic brunch, if I must say so myself, <laughs> for the brothers. You know, food will always get them there. Um, but our premise and our goal was to let them know that we were behind them, ready to rally as their cheerleaders, and would follow anything that they wanted to do or plan for our ministry. Now they were a little perplexed and a little mystified about our enhancing, spurring on encouragement, um, because they just thought they were coming to get a good breakfast, you know? But you know, after we ate, we pulled out some calendars that we had printed for everyone, and we began planning and forming ideas through their leadership. From that brunch, we established a singles planning committee that went on to revive the spiritual well-being and the strength of our ministry. Slowly but surely, we recharged the inspiration where we returned to a thriving, healthy, discipling group again. And we led the church by example in unity, stability, baptisms, and restorations. In three months, we had 12 baptisms and restorations. We were just like, let's do this. It was so inspiring. But I share this because as sisters, sometimes we think we can't be effective in encouraging a hopeful vision, especially when the brothers are in a moment of fatigue or weariness or absence in leadership. We can, but we just have to respectfully stay in our role. You know, as the sisters, we principally did what Nehemiah did. We prayed and we met the threat, the threat of no brothers leading. So sisters, you can respond to the call and be a difference maker, no matter what opposes you. Let God guide the process, direct your steps, and lead the vision to victory. Now, of course, though, whenever we say we're going to arise and build, Satan is right there saying, I'm going to arise and destroy, right? And he might not outright destroy us or get us to entirely cave in, but he will use tactics to keep us ineffective which is likewise destructive. And a lot of times he'll use people to keep us disheartened and distracted. You know, but Nehemiah was more concerned about the affairs of God than what people thought and their distracting stumbling blocks. He didn't acquiesce or lose his balance. He certainly didn't lose faith over it. And he didn't question himself as a leader. You know, about two weeks ago, I had a baby Christian, five months old, send me a text and say, I no longer want to attend the Boston church or be a member, and my decision is definite. I was discipling her. I was like, even though I, I knew in my heart that I had walked hand in hand um, with this girl, the first place I went in my heart was, I can't believe she's leaving. What didn't I do? Did I miss something? Maybe I could have, maybe I should have. You know, sometimes we go to those places, but I know that it's always someone's own personal decision to walk away, yet I stood there questioning myself. You know, a lot of times we get discouraged or we even have a sense of fear or our faith is affected if we see disciples who leave or who aren't committed or who don't follow. And we can feel like that says something about us as the leader leading the group, like it's a reflection you know, of our poor leadership. And I don't know if that's where the brothers go, but that's a lot of time where the women can go. You know, and of course, I, I mean, if you have things to improve on in your group and you need to get things, you know, faithfully going and something for your people to participate in, then certainly do that. Step your game up and go, you know. But if you're giving it your best with a heart full of faith and there are folks who don't follow or commit or doubt or leave, then just know that that's not a brand new situation. You know, I had to refer to Nehemiah because it was 
as God would have it, right? I was studying out Nehemiah at the time for this very lesson, so it was right on time. So I was like, let me look at what Nehemiah did, you know? Let me see what happened there. And you know, and we, when we read Nehemiah's story, we see that there were many faithful men and faithful women trying to serve God, his people, and the temple, and rebuild their part of the wall. But we also read on those same pages, amidst the faithful men and women, that there were also the unfaithful ones as well. You know, that tells us that we will always have the uncommitted among us. You know, history confirms it. You know, we can often have the mindset and the thinking that everyone should be strong and 100% devoted and committed, you know, especially under our watch, right? But you know what? We don't see that in the Bible, so we won't see that in this church. You know, Jesus, even after being re um, resurrected, right before giving the Great Commission, about to ascend, even in his scenario, it said, some doubted. You know, I feel like God has these details, you know, written down so that we can be inspired and look back today and go, oh, okay, so things are normal. You know what I mean? So if this is currently happening for you like it is for me, then just know that this is history just repeating itself. Amen? I mean, we can't just be faithful when there is a complete sense of like solidarity in our groups. I mean, first of all, that's not realistic, right? But also, you know, the real call to faith is in the acute and the critical and the testing times when things aren't 100%. You know, true faith is established in the wrestling with and the wrestling through the problems and the challenges and even the burdens of distress. You know, truly, we have no control of the variable factors that are going to happen, but we do have control of our faith. You know, but sometimes we, like, want God to just act now and magically fix or give us the answer or produce the right formula to change the growth or the momentum or the inspiration of our people. But truthfully, God desires us as the leaders to just act now and faithfully participate in moving and shaking things. He desires and wants that from us, for us to be faithfully involved. You know, when Jesus came to his hometown to teach the people, it says in Matthew 13, 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Our faith, or lack of, can stop God from moving. You know, this was Jesus' hometown, and he chose not to do miracles in his own hometown. It wasn't that he was incapable, and it wasn't that this town was really any different than any other. The only thing that was different and that was separating them from Jesus performing miracles there was their lack of faith. So where does your faith weigh in? What would your scale say? You know, perhaps that is how Jesus is influenced to respond, right there at that level. But here's the good news. When we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown himself, right? Second Timothy 2.13. So you know what, just go for it because he remains faithful the whole time. You know, it's never about the power of God. It's about you believing in the power of God. So demonstrate your faith so he can act on it. We serve a living God. Christ is alive in us. We have a faith that can move mountains. Are you sold out to the impossible of what God can do? You know, and when things are going just kind of fine, sometimes we can think it's our own strength, you know, and true faith isn't really required, you know, which kind of keeps us dependent on us, right? Get a few butterflies in your stomach and things shift, right? It's often then when we really rely and go to God. So there's nothing wrong with someone causing you butterflies. It's good to believe in something when it feels scary. You know, Matthew 14, 27 says, take courage, I am with you. You know, God is personally with us in this. And if everything makes sense and it all falls flawlessly into place consistently with everyone on board, there's no higher calling for us, for, our, to, for us to exercise our authentic faith. And even deeper, to see what we're truly made of in the storm. God loves to see our faith because without it, it's impossible to please him, right? So if it all just works out beautifully the whole time, it can kind of encourage us to have a sort of a faith by sight attitude, you know? But we need to have faith in the unseen things, in the throwing us off of our game circumstances, in the some people may not even value you settings, in the I have a dream that nobody supports or believes in scenarios, you know? 
Because what makes Nehemiah so incredibly inspiring, I think, is his bold dependency on faith when opposition and resistance was at his door. That's what's moving and motivating to me because it's the story of faith over fear, of triumph over tribulation, you know? That's what makes it epic and heroic. You know, 366 times in the Bible, it says, fear not. So that's one scripture for every day of the year while you are leading. And one extra, I guess, for leap year. So we're covered, right? <laughs> so often in leadership, there's a call to courage. You know, Israel was facing a very, very difficult time. The Assyrians had deported the 10 northern tribes and had basically scattered them all over the then known world. And then the Babylonians came in and just devastated and destroyed and nearly depopulated Jerusalem, right? And then held them in captivity for 70 years. You know, but that's so tremendously discouraging. And there are just things in leadership that are going to just be tremendously discouraging. You know, but sometimes when we're there, we can tend to think, oh my gosh, I've got a lot to work on with this group. Well, you know what? We've all got a set of lots to work on with our groups. That's just the way it goes. No one escapes that if you're in leadership. You know, and sometimes we can think also like, oh God, let somebody else do it. Well, you know what? We are that somebody else. We are, you probably wouldn't be sitting here in this room listening to this topic for sure. But you know, Nehemiah could have been like, why should I be involved? We heard this this morning, right? He could have been like, it's not my fault that my ancestors messed up and basically sinned against the Lord. I didn't, you know, and brought the, the judgment against the city of Jerusalem. You know, why was Nehemiah so concerned when he wasn't even living there? Think about that, right? He was nearly 800 miles away, chilling in the lap of luxury and royalty. That's, I don't know if I would have been thinking about anything sad if I was there. I mean, he had the most trusted role, right, in the palace, being the king's cupbearer. But nonetheless, his heart and his conviction was to show up, take personal responsibility, and lead the charge. You know, experience will fluctuate, right? You will have great experience and then you will have trying experience. Nehemiah understood the nature and character of God and trusted him over his experience. We don't want our faith to be contingent upon experience. You know, meaning like great experience, great faith. Trying experience, trying faith, right? It needs to be flipped. Trying experience, great faith. You know, that's where we need to be. We want our view of faith to come from the word of God because the word of God is unchanging in our very changing circumstances. Nehemiah unquestionably understood that and the wall was rebuilt in 52 days. In less than two months, the walls went from complete destruction to complete reconstruction and the walls of Jerusalem stood once again. You know, Jeremiah 32, 27, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Nehemiah believed what God could do and knew it would take steadfast, staying power to stay the course and make a difference in turning Jerusalem around. God will do his part. We just faithfully need to do ours. Thank you. Did Angela do a great job? Yes. Brother, she is single, so make sure you focus your fellowship. <laughs> Guys, can I read you a scripture? Come on. Yeah. Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 15, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days, and when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Guys, when God is behind something, there is nothing that will stop it. When we are building, let's expect opposition, but trust in God's character. And just as much as our people need vision for hope, we ourselves need to remain hopeful in our vision. Trust that God wants the work done more than you do. You know, I th when I think back on the campus ministry experience, that I had. I look at, at things today, those two seniors, one of them is leading a campus ministry in the Midwest. Uh -huh. One of them went off to plant a church up in Burlington, Vermont. Uh -huh. There were a couple of teens that would hang out with us because they thought we were cool. Oh. 
One of them's a disciple, the other one's currently proce- uh, in the process of being restored as a disciple. And a little bit of fruit came out of it. There was a guy I reached out to in the middle of, of that time who five, six years later became a disciple. And that was what God did after I had quit. Imagine what God can do if we remain faithful. Let's continue to build until God blesses our work. Whether the work is the construction of our ministries or the transformation of our own hearts, let God continue to build his kingdom. We can feel burnt out, we can feel down, we can feel discouraged, but let us always, always, always remain steadfast in God's character and never abandon his work. Thank you, guys.